as the Afghan refugees set out to resettle in communities throughout the United States, it is critical for the groups welcoming and facilitating this settlement will ensure an encouraging and meaningful settlement in the new communities. This integration process goes beyond the assumption of goodwill or common know-how to help the refugees. It involves a positive and holistic settlement entailing a sensitivity of their culture, religion, and history of the refugees and the actual people concerned. In addition to the settlement process, it will require essential religious connections and sensitivities, as well as the trauma evaluation and counseling. Further, Afghan families may fear an introduction into American societies, fearing prejudice um, toward Muslims. To this end, those involved in the settlement should possess sensitivity of their experience with a view to a supporting a restorative integration process. This healing will include cultural empowerment and the availability of culturally responsive resources within the Islamic community where they may receive religious guidance and a mosque or a place for daily prayer. It is important to be sensitive and respectful of the importance of faith as a way of life. This could be complicated because of language barriers. To promote a positive outcome of the resettlement process, which integrates a process of healing, we have organized a webcast on restorative Afghan refugee settlement and integration. The discussion will include expert presentations focusing on the Afghan people, their history, their faith, so that the refugee resettlement process is positive and restorative. Our speakers are both professionally capable and are experts in their fields of refugees and humanitarian assistance, as well as diplomacy. And also several of our experts have walked in these shoes. They know what it means to be a refugee. And so they are more than empathetic to this process. So without further ado, we're going to begin our program. Our first speaker will provide a reflection on the resilience of Afghanistan and Afghan people. And that presenter is Ambassador Ahmed Kamal. I've had the great honor to have worked or reported to Ambassador Kamal. Excuse me? I work at the United Nations with um, Ambassador Kamal. He is the former permanent representative of the permanent mission of Pakistan to the United Nations. I believe he served 12 years as permanent representative. He also has served as Pakistan's ambassador to France, Switzerland, and South Korea. And he is also an advisor to Grace Initiative. So without further ado, Ambassador Kamal, we're looking forward to your reflections. Thank you very much. Afghanistan is a mix of cultural entities. Uh, in the eastern part of Afghanistan, you have the Kyrgyz, which is the country, the territory to the east of Afghanistan. In the north of Afghanistan, you have Kazakhstan. <coughs> so you have the Kazakhs, <coughs> you have the Uzbeks, you have the Hazaras in the middle. And the southern part of Afghanistan is uh, the Pashtuns who speak Pashto. And so it's a multicultural territory, uh, which has uh, had a long history. Afghanistan doesn't have very good climate. It's cold most of the time, though it can get very hot in summer. And so the Afghans have a tendency to try to move out. Some of them moved down into Pakistan. There are millions who are now in Pakistan. Some of them moved west through Iran into uh, Jordan and into Europe and so and America. And so you have a number of Afghans who are seeking refuge in other countries in the West. Uh, that, that being said, uh, Afghanistan has had a long and very important history because from the 10th century onwards, the Afghan leaders have moved out. You had one by the name of Ghori Mahmoud, um, Ibrahim Ghori, G-H-O-R-I, who moved down into what was then India. 
and occupied parts of it and picked up whatever he could and took it back to Afghanistan. Then after him came another Afghan leader called Mahmoud Ghaznavi, G-H-A-Z-N-A-V-I, Ghaznavi, who also came to India, picked up whatever he could, took everything back to Afghanistan and uh, then uh, let, let India alone. Then came a very, very famous Afghan who was really a Kyrgyz in origin, whose name was Babar. Babar came to Afghanistan from Kyrgyzstan, from Afghanistan to what was then India, fought a major battle in India called the Battle of Panipat, P-A-N-I-P-A-T, defeated the Indians, defeated, uh, took over part of uh, India, and, and then settled in the northern part of India. The British got very worried and decided to invade Afghanistan. Now the Afghans have, as I told you, it's a multicultural ethnicity country, but there's one thing which unites them very much, which is that they hate foreigners. I repeat, they hate foreigners. And so when the British moved with an army into Afghanistan, the Afghans surrounded the British army, liquidated them totally, killed them all except one. And that one person, they deliberately let him alive so that he could get back home and tell everybody in the world what had happened to the Afghan army, which literally had been liquidated to zero. That was the British experience. People did not quite learn. One of the people who did not learn was the Soviets who decided to invade Afghanistan. And having invaded Afghanistan, they occupied almost all of it totally. And then the Afghans decided to kick the Soviets out. And so after a few years, the Soviets got back into their tanks and rolled back into the Soviet Union, leaving Afghanistan alone with its hate of foreigners. That was the Soviet experience in Afghanistan. Then others were tempted. The Indians, the Chinese, the Pakistanis, everybody tried to interfere in Afghanistan. And having interfered, they lost because you, you cannot occupy Afghanistan. And the country which has lost most badly is the United States, which is a huge superpower and it went in, occupied the whole of Afghanistan, stayed there for several years, and then just had to leave, lock, stock, and barrel. And so what you have opened your statement with about Afghan refugees is a result of the US occupation of Afghanistan over the period of 20 years. Now, I don't know whether you know what is 20 years. It's a lifetime. And so for a lifetime, Afghanistan has been occupied by an American army, which is no longer there. And so Afghanistan is back in its own pursuit of its own future. And it will have a future. It is not going to be a country that is totally dependent on you or anybody else. It has been a territory in which the people get along with each other. It's a poor country, but it survives and it has survived reasonably well for decades, if not centuries. And so we have the problem of Afghanistan, of a country occupied by many, the, the, the British, the Soviets, the Americans and others, and which does not like foreigners. And so the question is, what are we going to do with Afghanistan? It's a poor country. So do not expect it to have a standard of living comparable to what we have in other parts of the world. Now, I told you that one of the major people who entered Afghanistan was a person from Kyrgyzstan called Babur. Babur came to Afghanistan in the 14th century. And from Afghanistan, he then uh, he didn't quite like the weather. So he came into India and he, 
fought a major battle, the Battle of Panipat, which he won. And so he established what is called the Mughal dynasty in India at the end of the 14th century. And the Mughal dynasty lasts for 400, 500 years until the British decided to enter India and to knock the Mughals out. And so Babur, who had entered uh, India from Afghanistan, was always in love with Afghanistan. And so when he was dying, he said, I don't want to be buried in India. I want to be buried in Afghanistan. So Babur's tomb is in Kabul today. That was the Mughal dynasty, which ruled India for 500 years. And so there you are. You have in Afghanistan, poor, multi-ethnic, getting along poorly but reasonably well in a country which is very cold in winter and very hot in summer. Likes to move out. Lots of Afghan refugees here by the millions in Pakistan. Many of them moved into Iran, into Jordan, into Syria, into Italy, Germany, sorry, Greece, Britain, and the United States. And so the question really is, what are we going to do with a country or a territory which has lasted centuries, which is poor? That's all right. They get along. There's enough to eat. And if they can't find enough to eat, they move as refugees into one of the neighboring regions. The neighboring regions in the east, north, and west are not very hospitable. So they come into India or Pakistan. There are millions in Pakistan today or into Greece, Europe, United States. And so that being said, I will wait for you to ask me any questions that you might have about Afghanistan, its future. But please do not think of Afghanistan only as a refugee country with refugees in the United States. It's much longer history than that goes over centuries. So back to you for questions from your end. Over to you. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you. I don't have any question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Aga? To a person who has currency on this whole situation, that's Zahur Hussain, who was in Afghanistan for three and a half years as an interpreter and work with the uh, the Afghan forces and the, and the US Army as well as everybody. I don't have any questions, but I would uh, relate to you that the the problem that that, that, that we, we should really focus on the problem that we are facing right now, with the problem at hand. And, and that's all I'm gonna say. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, I guess I would like to ask you just one question, Ambassador Kamal. Thank you so much for your sort of historical perspective. Uh, we can go back to um, further comments and questions at the end of the presentation. Our next speaker, um, or our next two speakers, I should say, are going to reflect on both their personal and professional experience in um, working with refugees and also being a refugee. Our first speaker will be um, in Mr. Mohammed Kasim Popal, who is an Afghan national. He is also a lawyer settled in Toronto. He served with the UN mission in Afghanistan for 10 years, um, working in the area of humanitarian coordination. Um, and our second speaker also will be speaking from professional experience in developing an organization working with refugees and also having been a refugee. Um, and it's Dr. Khadun Al Musawi, who is a medical doctor and also has a, a master's in public health. And he is the founder and executive director of Mercy Hands for Humanitarian Aid. So, Mohammed, would you like to lead? Excuse me, uh, Ivan. Yes. Can I interrupt for a second? You also would be, which I would appreciate if you could give a chance at the end to Mr. Zahur Hussain. I am. And I have him on the agenda. Yeah, to share his experiences and his ability. I will. Okay. Hi, everyone, again. And uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, everyone, especially Mr. Kamal, for a great presentation about what's happening in Afghanistan. 
Uh, my name is Mohammed. A quick briefing. Uh, I have uh, worked with the United Nations Assistant Mission in Afghanistan for 10 years. And then I moved to Toronto. Uh, and Toronto, I work with multiple uh, nonprofit organization. And for the last five or six years, approximately, I work in, in uh, uh, immigration law firm, working with Afghan refugee directly uh, to resettle them in Canada. Uh, Overall, uh, I'm just uh, focusing on my experience as a youth worker in Afghanistan, and then I'll move on. And uh, lastly, I'll speak about what is what I'm, uh, am I doing now in terms of the Afghan evacuation uh, process. So overall, uh, and, and during my tenure uh, in the United Nations, mostly I was involved in international development and working with multiple UN agencies across Afghanistan on, on uh, different perspectives, first humanitarian and development. And we work with the uh, partners, uh, external partners like uh, UN agencies, international NGOs, allies, NATO forces, uh, PRT, we call provincial reconstruction teams, across Afghanistan to move. And then on um, 2012, I moved uh, to Canada and I'm settled here now. So, uh, but again, which I have interest in assisting the refugees in the IDPs in Afghanistan. And so I, I did my master's degree in policy and law and immigration law. And then I started my, another career as a, um, um, a immigration consultant here and then uh, mostly I was involved in people who are assisting, uh, who need assistance in terms of their uh, resettlement in Canada or uh, other countries. So uh, sadly, uh, what was happening in Afghanistan due because of those proxy war and neighboring push to war in Afghanistan. I was in Afghanistan in August and I was a witness one of the, uh, maybe the, one of the historical moment of the time in modern history, the, the fall of Afghanistan. Well, I, I'm not technically, I'm not calling it a fall of Kabul or fall of Afghanistan. I'm just technically call it uh, with the terminology, which is called Andover Afghanistan, because uh, the country was not fall to the Taliban. It was Andover to the Taliban. Uh, and, and, and overall, I was there. And from the maybe one week before the Andover Afghanistan, I was, I, I started assisting a lot of Afghans with their evacuation. And the first batch was 60 or 60 families of Afghan uh, journalists and media workers to move to Canada. And we submitted their application to the embassy in Kabul. And then we started up this, their application advising legally how to move on. And likely their application were accepted and then uh, I was also one of the, those evacuees from Afghanistan, from Afghanistan, and then I was evacuated by the military along with all those people who were intended to come to Canada and class these 60 families. So from that end, I start, uh, uh, because the situation, the people who uh, who were there, and I don't know whether this group, we have someone who were witness those, those moments which was happening in Afghanistan uh, on 15th of August and evacuation for the next 15 days. Uh, it was a very bad moment of life. And so I promised with myself to really help Afghans to, uh, to resettle, not only in Canada, but all across the country. Now across the world, I can assist them in terms of their legal perspective, especially what's, uh, how to approach with the unit CR, how to proceed their uh, paperwork, uh, whether it's a Canadian immigration or it's a German immigration process. So... Uh, uh, for the last four months, I'm deeply involved in resettling Afghans. And based on my experience, uh, 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 the, the, based on my experience, it's one of the noble jobs that I'm doing. And likely that by that time, the Canadian government also announced that that they are resettling at, the, at first with twenty thousand, then they said twelve forty thousand, but now I'm, I'm sure it's going up. And now, now they're selling approximately forty thousand. Um, have national to Canada based on two categories. The first category, which is mostly uh, uh, on people who work with Canadian government as an interpreter, coke driver, and so. Uh, and the second uh, category is based on five uh, five bases who we are qualified for. Uh, categories. First, they should be journalists or advocates, 
Second should be women leaders, LGBTQs, and people who work with Canadian non-NGO workers, and also people who has uh, were, uh, some, some types of relation that has helped Canadian journalists in the future. Uh, in, in that time that will enhance the Canadian perspective in Afghanistan, which is also coming in the next few years. So uh, we are now, uh, I'm uh, focusing on one particular uh, field that evacuating Afghans, journalists and uh, uh, women activists who are uh, coming to Canada. We are dealing them, mostly involving them to uh, evacuate them from Afghanistan to Pakistan and from Pakistan to uh, third country, mostly to Macedonia, because some 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 of people who were, have been evacuated to Pakistan, they're not also feeling safe. Well, I'm not talking on the politics side, but whatever they're not feeling, but they also moved to another country and the process is ongoing. So and now we have people uh, in process. Uh, we have three types of people, people who are in Afghanistan and, and, and their people are in the process to be evacuated third country, like Turkey, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, or um, uh, to uh, Macedonia. And the second group of people we have that there are approximately cleared for Pakistan or for cleared for Canada, and approximately they have uh, uh, some of them uh, have already uh, taken their visas, gained their visa, and they're, they're on the way to come to Canada. So overall, this is all what I'm doing now, and I'm uh, at, at here in the Canadian port. Also, I'm assisting some nonprofit organization and we're selling Afghans because most. Uh, luckily, Canada, Canadian government is so generous and so uh, so kind because most people who, like approximately all the people who have come to Canada for the last four months, they're settled in five star holders. They have good accommodation. They have uh, they have food that they have. They, well, they have uh, uh, donation centers. And they're they're well equipped. So, uh, but the system is very slow in terms of their green card. We call it PR card, permanent residency card. But overall, the entire process is slow, but it's very efficient. Uh, of course, I'm not saying the system is, is is perfect, but still, there is a room for improvement. And still, different partners, especially um, nonprofit organization of a bunch of volunteers on the ground in Afghanistan and other countries here. They're all working tirelessly to improve the, the prospect of this evacuation, this, this, this happening very smooth. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Welcome. deeply impressed, uh, jealously impressed by your background. <clears throat> but I would like to tell you that I myself am also a refugee. I was born in what was then British occupied India, so a British colony of and in 1947, when India and Pakistan became independent, my father, who was then the Solicitor General to the Government of India, decided that we were going to migrate to Pakistan. So we left all our lands and belongings, all in India, and came over to Pakistan. And I remember that when my father became the Solicitor General to the Government of Pakistan, his desk was a large wooden crate and his chair was a smaller crate on which he would sit and work. And that was how Pakistan was created and governed. But that being said, where I have a minor disagreement with you is on the fact that the problem of Afghanistan, which is about 40 million Afghans, cannot be resolved in Canada or Pakistan or any or the United States or any other country. Mm. It has to be resolved in Canada itself. And that is what we should be concentrating on. Instead of trying to pick up these people from other countries and resettle them in hundreds or thousands in Canada, United States, etc. It is in Afghanistan that we should try to be creating small factories so that jobs can be created in Pakistan, in Afghanistan itself, so that the Afghans can earn a living in Afghanistan and create a better and more prosperous territory in which they have lived for centuries. So mm -hmm. that being said, we have a lot of work to be done in Afghanistan. And I'm sorry, we are not doing as much as we should be doing. 
It's not enough to have summit conferences. Uh, what we need is to create small factories. And so if you can create a small factory for anything, I don't care whether it's a factory which creates uh, drinks or paper or pens or whatever. That is what we need in Afghanistan so that jobs can be created and people, and once you begin creating jobs, it always blossoms and spreads. And so jobs will create more jobs. And mm -hmm. so Afghanistan will be back in happiness at a certain stage. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, we have to move forward. Um, Dr. Khaldun Amusawi. Thank you so, so much, Yvonne. Uh, really, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, thank you, Mr. Kamal and Mr. Mohammed, for the great presentation. Um, well, like Yvonne said, um, I'm originally from Iraq. Um, I was born in Baghdad. I, I'm not just a refugee. I'm also um, a, a, an IDP, internally displaced person. And, um, I was uh, displaced when I was a teenager uh, during the 1991 war in, uh, on Iraq. And then, um, you know, in 2014, I became a refugee here in the United States. Uh, but before that, in 2004, right after the war in 2003, uh, the war on Iraq um, and the fall of Saddam regime, uh, I founded uh, Mercy Hands for Humanitarian Aid, a local NGO. Uh, the headquarters is in Baghdad. Uh, it has grown since then. It's one of the biggest uh, uh, Iraqi humanitarian NGOs. Uh, we operate uh, uh, nationwide all over Iraq. We also had a small mission in northeast Syria. Uh, but in 2019, I co-founded Mercy Hands Europe, uh, which is a, 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 an international humanitarian NGO based in Geneva. Uh, and in 2020, uh, um, I co-founded Mercy Hands America, which is based here in the U.S. Um, we've been um, providing support to refugees uh, since 2005 through first through Mercy Hands for Humanitarian Aid the, or Mercy Hands Iraq, if you will. Um, first, we worked on refu uh, Sudanese, uh, Palestinian, uh, Iranian, uh, and Syrian refugees. Uh, that was in 2005 after the fall of Saddam regime. Um, you know, those refugees were in Iraq before the fall of regime. They were seen as supporters of of Saddam. So after the fall of the re regime uh, in 2003, they were basically targeted uh, by the um, locals uh, because they, like I said, they were seen as supporters of Saddam. Um, so, you know, we, we provided support and help to them uh, in partnership with UN agencies, mainly UNHCR. Um, the focus, our focus at that time was to provide legal aid uh, and help them with uh, resettlement uh, and uh, for some of them repatriation, going back to their uh, country of origin, um, which was voluntary. I mean, it was not uh, enforced or coerced. Um, so that was our you know, first experience with refugees uh, in 2005. And we worked uh, uh, with them for a few years. Uh, currently we uh, focus uh, on providing support to Syrian refugees uh, in Iraq. Um, and uh, to a lesser extent, we're actually getting some Afghani refugees. Um, most of them, they arrive Iraq by mistake. Uh, they, they are misled by, uh, uh, you know, um, 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 uh, human traffickers. Um, and they end up being, you know, they end up in Iraq. Um, especially in uh, Kurdistan, Kurdistan region of Iraq. So we try to provide support uh, to them. Uh, most refugees, if not all refugees in Iraq, you know, they um, think of Iraq as a, you know, a, a, a temporary station. Uh, all of them, they want to, almost all of them, they want to uh, resettle in a, a third country. So uh, what we do mainly is to provide psychosocial support to them, um, also emergency aid, um, different forms of emergency aid, um, and also legal aid. Um, so that's uh, our focus 
uh, on refugees in Iraq. Uh, through Mercy Hands America, we also provide um, support to refugees here in the US, uh, mostly Iraqi and Syrian, but recently also Afghani refugees. And um, the kind of support we provide here, Mercy Hands America here is a smaller NGO. So um, our services are not really extensive, but basically we provide medical and psychosocial support to uh, uh, individual refugees here, Iraqi, Syrian, and Afghani. Um, and we also um, uh, do some research um, and surveys to gather more information about uh, the situation of refugees here. Um, and I can tell you, you know, I directly uh, interact um, and with with refugees, and I can tell you, uh, you know, the problem is really big, and it's really sad what's going on. Um, many nonprofits here, um, and also governmental agencies, uh, they provide support to refugees here but really i w i like to call their support as passive support i mean they offer all these services to refugees um but they don't really um um go out there and try to help refugees or identify refugees who need help and actually majority of the refugees here they do have issues psychosocial issues um, I mean, I read reports about um, the uh, um, prevalence of uh, PTSD, depression and anxiety among refugees here. And they talk about, you know, like uh, the percentage can be 50 percent uh, plus minus. But honestly, you know, um, based on my interaction with refugees, I would say the you know, majority, the vast majority of, of refugees here, whether Iraqi, Syrian or Afghani, you know, they have some sort of some level of um, um, psychological or psych psychiatric uh, disorders, whether it's PTSD, uh, anxiety, depression and uh, others. Um, so but to be able to identify them, I mean, you need to approach them probably like in, a, in, a, in an active, you, you should have an, an active approach um, to these issues rather than passive. I mean, I hear from the refugees here that nonprofits here in the US, um, they uh, offer all these kinds of services, um, but then they depend on refugees to um, step forward and ask for help. And majority of refugees they don't do that for different reasons um it's not the time or the place to discuss these reasons but we end up with really sad situations and i have so many you know sad stories that i can share with all of you but the most recent one was um, um it, an afghani refugee but not post august 21 uh, wave of uh, refugees but you know prior to that um uh, he, he was in the U.S., uh, you know, for a couple of years, but, and he had a medical condition. He couldn't breathe. He was in his, uh, he was in m mid twenties. Um, he couldn't breathe. He turned blue, according to his wife, um, and still he would not go to the hospital, to the emergency room, uh, although he had insurance. It was provided by uh, a nonprofit here in Georgia. Uh, but he wouldn't go to the emergency room because he was afraid that the copay will be uh, uh, very high, and he did, just didn't have money to uh, to pay. So he ended up dying. Um, I mean, they took him to the hospital, um, and he just he was gasping for air. He was not he he was barely breathing, uh, and by the time he arrived to the hospital, uh, he was already dead. Uh, they tried to uh, resuscitate him. They were able to. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, resuscitate. His brain was dead uh, already, so his heart started beating again, and he was on the ventilator. Uh, he was dependent on the ventilator, and but eventually, the family they had to make the decision to take him off the ventilator, and he was announced dead. And uh, it was really that's just that's just one story, and I think it's really representative of. Uh, what's going on with refugees in general, not just Afghani. I mean, I have similar stories for Syrian and Iraqi refugees here in Georgia. 
and elsewhere in other states um um you know they, they we assume here in the u.s us who've been here for years and we uh, uh resettled and integrated well uh within the community uh we assume that uh, those refugees they know some basics we we think of them as basics uh like you know uh, the copay for example or i i had a family uh, they didn't leave their apartment for a few days not even going you know in the front yard because they didn't have ids and they just they were under the impression that they can't leave the house without an id um, and i had to go and like uh, help them get some food for them because they were so afraid the kids wanted to go out you know and play in the garden but they just their parents wouldn't let them go out because they didn't have ids um, so i mean they need the, the the refugees here for you know we're talking about i mean the, our focus today is the um uh, the uh, settlement uh, resettlement process um we need to do more to help the afghanis uh, resettle here in the U.S. We need to be uh, more active and engaging uh, with the Afghanis uh, if we want to help them um, uh, resettle here and integrate within the community. Um, and so, I mean, that's uh, um, that's my personal account, um, and I'm, I'm open for any questions. I congratulate Thank you, you. Thank on you. the work that you are doing. Because if one person needs help and you go out and help that person, you deserve the thanks and congratulations of everybody. And you're doing more than one person. You're helping hundreds, if not thousands. I know what Mercy Help is doing, and it's great work. <clears throat> Just don't forget the point that I'm making, which is that the problem of Afghanistan has to be solved in Afghanistan itself and not with the refugees in Canada, United States, Pakistan, or anywhere else. Over to you for a question from your end. Thank you. Um, any questions, Mohammed, before you leave? Uh, thank you very much. It was a great presentation for uh, with Mr. Kamal and Mr. Khalid Musawi. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to go I, in five minutes. I have another meeting. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, always to have a discussion with our grandson, Mr. Kamal. Uh, of course, the Afghanistan uh, the conflict and issue cannot be solved in Canada or in a third country on Islamabad headquarters. It should be uh, resolved in uh, Afghanistan. But uh, unfortunately, this this proxy in a hybrid war has pushed the country deeper, deeper, and it's such a, a cat catastrophe that what is happening now, unfortunately, and uh, well, uh, approximately every one of us in around the you know, around the world is responsible for what's happening in that part of the world. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. I also thank, thank you so you. much. And oh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Um, Al Musawi or Khaldun. I think that's one of the points of this webcast is is a tutorial to help organizations who may be involved in resettlement and hopefully also helping the um, the people in Afghanistan but being proactive and um, you know how we can help them re restore that it's just not a process it's a really holistic so and things that we may take for granted I, I just got contacted recently saying, oh, do you know anyone who speaks Pashtun? And they knew that they were resettling the refugees four months ago, that they would be coming in January. And these are like, oh, just something like language, let alone knowing how do you operate in the United States? Where, what would you do if you go to the hospital? Or if, you know, so many little points that are basic that we take for granted that will be new to them and how to, how to just survive and live in the United States. It's not easy. Yes, but may I add a point? Major decisions have to be taken on the question of the Afghans. I mentioned that you have to concentrate on opening small factories in Afghanistan, but governments have to take decisions also. The government of Pakistan, 
Pakistan is a uh, long country, uh, a thousand miles across, not uh, more than a th almost 2000 miles north to south. And a lot of trade takes place across roads in trucks. And so the government of Pakistan took the decision that we would allow Afghans to operate trucks on Pakistani roads. And the result is that today, all the trucks on Pakistani roads, all the trade is being conducted by Afghans in their trucks. So trade has been taken over by Afghanistan truckers. So that sort of thing is what helps ultimately uh, resolve a problem of a territory in which 40 million people need our help. Thank you. Okay, um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Karen Fondacaro. She is a professor of psychological science at the University of Vermont. She's also a director of the Leiten Lettenberg Center for Evidence-Based Practice, and she is the director of Connecting Cultures. And she will discuss her experience in trauma evaluation for the first group of refugees that have arrived in Vermont. Karen? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, to the speakers already. It's been fascinating to hear everything that you have to say. So I am going to talk a little bit about what we have done um, in terms of very specific to mental health and well-being for refugees who are here in Vermont and the New England area. And I actually put together a little slide um, show. Is that okay to share some of those screens? Yeah. So I think, I, I, think me, I need access to do that. Let me see if I can. You can give me power to share. <laughs> oh, well, I, I'm going to try to do that. Um, Being an academician, I've always got like slides to show, so. <laughs> okay, so we want to share. I will do that. It just says the multiple participants can share, I think, is the button. Yeah, I have it. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. So I put together a little presentation here. Um, and obviously in 10 minutes, I'm not gonna be able to speak extensively, but um, I think as, um, was it Hadoun who said that refugees aren't gonna come and get services. We really need to do outreach and, um, and really go to the communities. Am I getting that right or did I get the wrong name there? Yes, ma'am, you got it right. Yeah, and I think that was so important that in 2007, we started a program called Connecting Cultures because we knew that there were extensive mental health and we typically try to call it well-being needs for refugee individuals, but individuals were not comfortable seeking services. So we really had to go out into the communities and work with um, work with the communities and talk to them about their perceptions of mental health and well-being in order to get a program going so that people could access services. So we started a program called Connecting Cultures and really went into the communities for, for years. We have about 30 countries of origin in Vermont now um, of resettled refugees. And it really took off from there um, growing into us working with legal services and also with um, physical health and in particular physical therapy for folks who end up with um, chronic pain associated with maybe a torture experience, for example. And so we now are providing mental health services, psychological services, case management, really for basic needs, and then working with other um, organizations to make sure that we're providing holistic um, interventions. But the types of evaluations that we do for trauma include two different kinds. One is an evaluation for treatment or intervention or what is the individual or the family or the community's need. And the other one is we also participate in psychological asylum evaluations. So for those um, refugee for those asylum seekers who are seeking um, asylum, we work with uh, with attorneys and prepare the psychological evaluations. But first, I'm going to talk about the 
um, the evaluation that we do of trauma for specifically for what we would do for intervention or working with the communities. And specifically with the Afghan refugees coming into Vermont, you know, again, we have refugees from over 30 countries, but the Afghan refugees have been told we're um, going to be getting about 100 individuals with about 40% being children. So we really have a slightly, well, a similar model, but we actually use a model for children that's very tier-based. It's four different tiers and it's called trauma systems therapy. And the evaluation is that different kids need different things. So really we start with the broader bottom you can see of the pyramid, which is really getting those kids who are doing okay, engaged in the community, whether it's sports or music or any kind of making sure that they're engaged socially and that they're doing okay and doing okay in school. So that's really the evaluation of sort of that group of kids. And then there's another group in sort of the second tier, which is typically a little smaller, but these are the kids who we go into the schools and um, actually set up school-based uh, groups. And we have to work with the schools. We work with cultural brokers. We work with the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. And that's a resettlement agency, an ethnic community where we really work with individuals who are part of the refugee community too, and with interpreters. So in those groups, the evaluation really points at those kids needing to be able to talk openly about acculturative stress. What's it like in a new country? Um, what are they being discriminated against? And being able to talk with, it, with, with amongst themselves as kids, but also with a cultural broker and also someone who's skilled at doing the groups. And then the third tier we engage in with children is really a school-based, they may need some counseling, maybe they can't focus on their work, maybe they're having some flashbacks, really getting mental health intervention, but in the school. And then the highest tier of um, evaluation and intervention is where we would go into the homes and work with the whole family system and sometimes into the community. And this is when a when a child or an adolescent is really struggling with not being able to integrate into the school system. And we work with Boston Children's Hospital who helped, who developed this trauma system therapy for refugees and also with Dr. Saida Abdi and our director of family and children's services really is working through a SAMHSA grant that we got. Um, and I think it's really going to be a wonderful model for making sure that we reach as many kids as we can. Now for adults, when we're really doing our evaluation of what is the need, we really have to use culture, cultural humility and ask questions, not pretend we know what's going on for someone. So what is your view of the problem? What does well-being mean to you, to your family, to your community or your culture? How does spirituality play into this? We really have to approach it with questions and we have to use cultural brokers to understand the different cultures. It's sometimes challenging because we have so many different cultures, but now all of our clinicians and our program, individuals working in the program really do need to learn about Afghanistan and the culture and also listen to people who are, who are um, believe it or not, not now people do seek services from us because they've learned from family members or community members that we're a safe place to come to. And we also have satellite offices um, closer to the communities. But we really do use what we call a biopsychosocial spiritual model and really making sure, and I think as Yvonne said before, that we are attending to spirituality and listening to people's spirituality in the process of healing too. And then um, someone did say specifically, and I think it was um, Haldun again, that the most common Western defined mental health concerns that we see are post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and depression. And that is really the case for a number of folks. Um, and 
one of the things that's been very important to us and that we've learned over time is that um, we don't believe it's a disorder that needs to be fixed. We think what's disordered are the wars and all the um, challenges that people have had to face. The experiences are what is disordered, not the individuals that we're dealing with, and that we need to have a holistic lens. So in addition to some of these issues that some individuals are definitely experienced and that we're looking at, we also realize that it's not Whereas post-traumatic stress sometimes indicates that it's in the past, what we have found is that some of these concerns are more chronic. People are still experiencing loss and lots of grief and ongoing concerns. So we've developed a model based on what we've seen. And really what we've seen is tremendous resilience and strength, amazing resilience and strength of refugees coming to Vermont in particular, because that's who we're working with. But the other things that we see is that people are grieving over loss of their family members. They're grieving over loss of their culture in their home. They're sometimes being welcomed into poverty, which is a problem. And I think speaks to the issue that the ambassador spoke about, which is we have this two system need, which is to assist in Afghanistan but also when individuals are here, we need to holistically um, provide the support so that they can be successful. They're adjusting to a new culture. There's unemployment. There's loss now due to the pandemic if we look at contextual factors. Individuals are coming with very serious torture experiences and some experiencing traumatic stress, flashbacks, nightmares, dissociation, so many different concerns that they're struggling with. And we do believe that we have to look at it, that these can be sort of ongoing issues and that it's not that we're just looking at something that happened in the past. Um, so we have developed a model and we have this, um, an app that we've developed with it. And we are working with um, individuals as best as we can. Um, and then, so those are, that's the evaluation of traumatic stress that we'll do with both children and with adults and adolescents, and also provide the intervention in the communities and in the homes. And then we also, the other kind of evaluation we do is for this psychological asylum eval for those who are seeking um, asylum. And those are extremely challenging to do and to be part of. If you're the person being evaluated, they're very, um, they're very challenging because it's where the person is telling their torture story. And very briefly, I'll just tell you that we engage in these evaluations to assist the legal process. And what we find is that for those cases that have a psychological evaluation, these individuals are more likely to receive asylum. And um, we, the process is we work with a lawyer, we have discussions with an interpreter, we take down detailed notes and we actually write an evaluation of the trauma and torture history. And it goes along with the person with their affidavit and the legal team that goes and um, presents themselves in front of an immigration attorney. And the evaluations take quite a bit of time. And um, our clinicians and our team, I think the biggest thing that they learn is how to tolerate the intensity of the emotions that come with trauma and torture, because it's such a challenging, um, it, these are challenging stories that people um, are talking about. We've also developed treatment, but I'm not gonna get into um, our treatment development today, but we've developed treatments with our cultural brokers and um, certainly have published a lot of this um, most recently. And, um, it's, it's been um, an intense experience for me, what I value and have the most passion for in terms of my job. And I just hope that some of the work that we do um, can assist these folks. Well, thank you so much, um, Karen. I think one of the points that you brought out about trauma and that it's not just about the past. I mean, just being here is a traumatic experience and every single element. And as Dr. Um, 
how Duma Masawi pointed out, just these basic things like going to a hospital, what will I need? What the trauma is like almost every day. There's another form of trauma. It's like, how do you transcend? So I think it's, I guess, building a resilience. Um, it's, of course, it's your job, but you know, the pathway to resilience when you've just deal, dealt with turmoil and you've got more turmoil and it's ongoing. So I, I think it is um, definitely one of the um, challenges that everyone who is going to be supporting the integration into the United States or in any other country for refugees. Um, yeah, I, you know, the one thing that I would add to, and I think when I think about people who are working with resettled refugees, many people think that, oh, I need to get them to tell their story. And I always think of it as no one asked for a story that includes trauma and torture, and they should really have control over when they talk about it and who they want to talk to about it. And I think that's a, a really important thing for people to also recognize when, because I know some people get it in their head that, oh, it's good for people to talk about their trauma. And that can be true, but the person really has to have control over it themselves. And that could also be cultural, you know, certain cultures, they like to talk about everything and, and yeah. certain cultures, they don't talk about their lives personally. You could go on a train in the United States and somebody will tell you their whole life story, <laughs> you know, exactly. and then they'll get off the train to buy, but that wouldn't necessarily happen in exactly. another culture. <laughs> you know, this is very personal and I don't know who you are and why am I sharing this story with you? So, and that's the cultural responsiveness and humility, I think. Yeah, exactly. Humility is key to helping someone crossing barriers. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Mr. Zahor Hussein and um, Aga Jaffrey, you will give some commentary, but Zahor is working also with the refugee resettlement in Connecticut. And uh, Zoho, would you like to share some uh, reflections and observations of this process? Yes. Uh, well, I've been with the, the group for a while that they resettled the refugees from Afghanistan here with the families. But before, you know, I've been listening to everyone and this, was, this is the first time that I am involved in, you know, refugee settlements. And by listening to you guys, you guys have a lot of experience. But a lot of the things that you talk about is different than what I've experienced because being on the ground and being in the United States is totally different. We, we take things and say, hey, you know what? This is, what, this is what, what is necessary for the people that are coming in. In my opinion, it is to understand a culture is totally different than what we see. When you bring out a family here, and I have been working with families that, that are here, and it's, it's totally different. Some people are here because of the torture, as she said, and some people are here because they wanna have a better life. When it comes to Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, or Yemen, or wherever the refugees are from, we need to understand better. We can't just, you know, say, hey, this is what they need. The first thing is to understand a culture. Pac uh, Afghanistan has 52 different dialects in Pashto. It is a very difficult language when it comes to understanding because just like in Arabic, if you go from Iraq to Syria, the dialect changes and the word meaning changes. So when you talk to people, you have to understand what they are saying. Some, you know, I have been translating for this group and some of the things that they tell me, the Pashtun people, the, the refugees, they say, hey, you know, it is really, really hard for me to understand the person that is talking to me. And to translate one word, sometimes it becomes a paragraph. And that paragraph, you know, when you are talking about it, it's like, it's an explanation of broad things for the other person to understand. I, as an interpreter or who've been to Afghanistan on ground for four years, I've seen the best, I've seen the worst, but that's 
I cannot change it because my job was just to, you know, translate it or interpret it into what the understanding would be. Uh, Ala Jafri has invited me, and this is the first time that I'm here, and I, I, I am just at a loss of words to say, well, you know, Afghanistan needs fixing. No, Afghanistan needs dialogue. It needs to, I, I am sorry if I tell you this, that, hey, you know, women's rights are not acceptable. No, they are. But you cannot go into a culture and say, hey, you know what? We need to do this for the woman first. No, you need to go and talk to the men, talk to the people that are above or who are governing. You need to make them understand first before you install something. The refugees are great. You know, you, you uh, right now, I think we have about 20,000 people at the uh, certain camps, you know, in Georgia and uh, Virginia, Texas. I think there are some in Alabama. So 20,000 people is a great thing that, you know, you bring them over, but it's not enough because you know, we've got 40 million over there. And I don't know if I'm speaking in the right connotation, but, uh, or the right, you know, for me to say something, but this is what I've observed. And uh, I've been working here as a volunteer with uh, Danbury, the Irish, uh, the Integrated Immigration uh, and uh, the Integrated Refugees and Immigration uh, Society, who is in Danbury. And they just have a few families that are coming in, but it's hurry up and wait is the kind of situation when it comes to the refugees. Um, anything other than that, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe you... um, Aga, would you like to make any reflections? Yes, I, uh, I have a, a, a brief commentary on, on our dialogue over here. Uh, you know me, my name is Aga Jaffrey. I've been uh, associated with, uh, well, I'm a community health worker. That's community worker, really, basically, nothing more than that. I've been involved with the Alpui Benevolent Foundation for the last 40 years, ever since their, uh, you know, inception. And uh, they are, Mr. Busvi is around. He should know. Uh, if he's around, he should know about the Alpui Foundation. And you have, you have also yourself worked with them. Uh, they are into Iraq, into Syria, in Lebanon, in uh, Yemen. I didn't hear Yemen word at all in the discussion unless until uh, the who mentioned that. I personally think that no one society or one group should have a monopoly or persecution. I mean, we have got these refugees coming from, of course, the uh, uh, Awanis have the currency and uh, the most recent, you know, uh, trauma and tragedy. And and we are doing the best we can as a society. al Kui Foundation, by the way, is a special status NGO. Okay. Do you know that in 40 years, they have not received a simple, they are especially, they have not received a single penny of grant either from the UN or from the US government, that is US aid and the, and the State Department, not at all. They work on the homes money. Um, you need a Shia to understand that, but Qum says it's like zakat. And all that money is spent. Let's say Sistani is a Marja a Taqlid, and he is in, uh, as you know, in Najaf, Iraq, and he has been shelling out that money millions of dollars. I would say about a billion dollars is money going out. I've been there, I've been to Najaf. I, I'm, I'm a Pakistani, I'm not, not an Arab. Uh, and I have seen some amazing work that they do. They're working in Yemen right now. They have been working in Afghanistan for a long time and, and everywhere. These people really, uh, I don't want to say that, uh, uh, but I know NGOs, uh, uh, Iran, there are NGOs uh, uh, and there are NGOs. I mean, uh, how sincere they are, some of them, I really wonder. I know I know NGOs whose uh, keepers stay, uh, when they come to Manhattan, they stay in Waldorf Astoria, and they jump from one meeting to another meeting. Uh, is, is their real work is being done or not? You come to Al Hui Foundation, it's Maidane it Hashr. It is, it is, they really are what you call basic, you know, and they are doing, um, the amount of money they have shelled out, you will not believe it as, as, as homeless money. And, 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 and that's what we need to, uh, people, the, the whole, uh, the ambassador, uh, Kamal, have outlined as to how we should have these uh, service delivery network and they should be effective and they should be done. We should spend more money in giving it to people, the needy people, than managing 
and, and running these uh, plus NGOs, that's all. Thank you so much, um, Aga Jaffrey. I, I agree with you that the most important part of this, and I know Khadun knows this, is to stay mission driven and not to make your mission about raising money, but first about serving the people. And I know that Khadun believes this wholeheartedly and, um, and Karen as well. And I think in terms of the Afghan refugees, um, just briefly, we are also being considered um, as a interim resettlement um, agency in, in Vermont. <laughs> and um, I think one of the reasons is that uh, most of the people with Grace Initiative have worked in post-conflict countries and have worked with refugees or IDPs. And I myself have worked on five UN missions, but what makes the Afghan and probably also Iraq, but the Afghan situation, I think particularly um, heart-wrenching, if we want to say that if they're the refugee of the day or something, is that I think for for the United States, and as I've, you know Kamal pointed out, Ambassador Kamal pointed out, this kind of results from an intervention. And this intervention was from 9-11, and we never had a reconciliation for 9-11. We never came, the United States, Americans never came together to find peace, to reconcile within themselves from this intervention. But then we set out to go into Afghanistan and spend 20 years there. And ironically, 20 years later, we're taking in the refugees from this intervention. So in a way, it's kind of bringing closure to 9-11. Uh, paradoxically, it's not a purpose, of course, but the reconciliation and understanding these people, everything they have gone through, it's really important for the people, especially in the United States or who have, or other countries who have been involved in the intervention in Afghanistan to make the, to really make this process um, as positive as possible for the communities in which they are resettling and for the individual Afghanis and their, their families. So um, that perhaps we can all move forward, transcending all of our traumas together. Um, this is much as a kind of a personal point of view. Um, so are there any other comments we're going to conclude with anyone else? Yeah, I just want to, if you don't mind, uh, Yvonne, um, I just wanted to add, you know, well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Saraga and, and Karen uh, for the great um, presentation. I just wanted to say, uh, you know, about the scarce funding. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. About the scarce funding, uh, you know, that goes to what, uh, I mean, Karen was saying about uh, her approach, the holistic approach. Uh, sometimes, you know, and what, what what Yvonne as well said about mi being mission driven, you know, we do simple activities uh, that don't require a lot of funding, but they, they have big impact. For example, we, we've done it before with Palestinian refugees here. Uh, we we go look, uh, look for uh, well-established or wealthy uh, uh, Palestinian refugees, and then we ask them to um, share their story with uh, new refugees, um, and uh, and you know to act as a role model for the new refugees. And we've noticed, I mean, w that was very helpful by you know by those wealthy um, refugees or well-established refugees sharing their stories with the new refugees. That gives hope. For the new refugees, that you know, uh, resettlement uh, um, will be, you know, easy, and then they can be just like that uh, role model. Uh, and it's not just that, you know, um, uh, bringing those wealthy or well-established refugees with young uh, new refugees and bringing them together, uh, you know. Um, we've noticed, um, you know, th so most of those wealthy or well-established ref uh, refugees, they have businesses here in the U.S. and they offer uh, job opportunities for those young refugees. Uh, so, I mean, doing such activities 
that's not uh, that doesn't require a lot of funding but it has big impact on refugees and uh, refugees resettlement process thank you thank you yeah i when you just brought that up um Haldun, i was thinking of the women's training center that we had the great opportunity to collaborate with mercy hands in basra but something like that would also be um we provide a good model in the united states where there's training, vocational training, um, small uh, cottage industry development, childcare, language. And this also would kind of integrate um, some of Ambassador Kamal's points of view that we, people have to become um, self subsistence and have their own businesses. And that's another form of healing, <laughs> becoming less reliant on agencies and becoming more self-reliant. This segment is particularly important in view of the recent passing of Nobel laureate Archbishop Desmond Tutu and his extraordinary works in reconciliation and healing. Canon Walter Brownridge of the Vermont Diocese will offer some reflections of Desmond Tutu as his guidance relates to refugee resettlement. Reverend Canon Walter Brownridge is the canon to the ordinary for cultural transformation of the Vermont Episcopal Diocese. Previously, Walter has served congregations in Ohio, Delaware, New York City, and South Africa, and for five years was Dean of St. Andrew's Cathedral in Honolulu, Hawaii. Prior to his ordination, Walter practiced law for 10 years as a federal prosecutor and in the area of public policy and served as a Lieutenant in the US Marine Corps. Cultural transformation is a 21st century way of describing our mission. And together we will seek to restore the dream of God for all of us and the world. So now Walter, we're waiting for your remarks. <laughs> Thank you, Yvonne. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, for all those who will be watching this. Um, thank you for the, allowing me to share some thoughts with you. Um, I want to talk about three things very briefly. Um, first, um, I think that whether you are a religious person and, and if you're religious, whatever faith um, you have, or if there's no faith, if you're strictly a secular person, that we are all called to be <laughs> really human uh, to, to, and the best version of being a human being. And so I wanna talk about the humanitarian aspect of this work. Secondly, um, my experience of having lived and worked in South Africa um, in uh, the uh, middle 2000s and then my continual work of visiting and studying uh, and teaching there um, off and on um, about how the practical impact of, of, of a society that um, struggle sometimes with refugees, but how that we're called to still be, um, as Yvonne would say, of being able to welcome the stranger and, uh, and, and how that's our call. And then I'll end thirdly with just the remembrance about Archbishop Tutu and how he always reminded us that this is um, what we need to be about. So I would just first say, as uh, groups who are working in this area of humanitarian, um, whether secular or religious, the idea is that we are called this <laughs> place, this rock that we float in the universe within um, is a fragile place. It's our island home. And for a variety of reasons, um, environmental, um, the climate crisis, um, war, famine, whatever reasons, um, we are living through this greatest um, sense of migration and refugee um, uh, growth in numbers that we've ever experienced of people having to move for a variety of reasons. And um, particularly um, as the war in Afghanistan, the United States involvement and in it ended, um, creating another pressure point of deep human tragedy and need. And it's so I commend those who've been willing to step forward and, and, and welcome the stranger and offer their homes and communities as a place. 
it's what we're called to do if we together on this planet, um, regardless of our nation, our community, um, creed or no creed, whatever it is, if we can be that kind of welcoming um, body. Um, secondly, uh, I will say that uh, when I served in Cape Town, South Africa, um, on the staff of the cathedral, uh, St. George the Martyr, um, the Anglican Cathedral there um, in 2003 to 2006, um, we had a lot of outreach and ministry to refugees who had come from various parts of Africa normally, um, places like the DRC and um, Rwanda, Burundi, um, the Sudan, um, parts of Kenda and Uganda, um, all who were seeking refuge, sanctuary from wars um, and other forms of oppression and danger. And they were coming into the nation, into the large cities in particular, like Johannesburg, uh, Durban, and Cape Town, for example. And there was sometimes concern. There were folks who complained, uh, as often is the case, about the arrival of refugees. But um, both civil society, um, leaders in our community, as well as, as well as the government who had been involved in um, the anti-apartheid struggle to end uh, that brutal system. So many of them uh, during the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s had to flee South Africa for their lives and were exiled. And so they were refugees for political reasons in other countries. And so I was fondly remembering when Africa Day, which comes around in um, May each year, um, which celebrates all the nations of Africa and, uh, and uh, it's sponsored by the, um, the African Union to celebrate a unity that we hope that they could achieve. Um, in South Africa, one of the themes was that we should celebrate Africa Day. And one way we do that is by welcoming the refugees because the people coming from these various countries where they don't have a home now, welcome the, 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 the heroes, the, the freedom fighters who had to flee South Africa during the old apartheid days. And they were welcomed into those communities. And so now it was South Africa's turn to exchange the favor. And I just thought that was just a wonderful image that um, of this circularity of life. And it's not simply in Africa where this happens, but all over the world, including, including the United States. We are a, a, a nation that is often accepted, not only immigrants, but refugees. Um, and, and that's um, because except for the indigenous community, everyone else in the United States is from somewhere else as well for a variety of reasons. And I'll lastly just make this comment um, as we are now um, three and a half, four days away from the death of my mentor, um, role model friend, um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who I had the, the pleasure of working with when I worked in South Africa. But then for years after that of uh, bringing students over to meet him when I was a seminary dean, and uh, when I was a cathedral dean, uh, at, and, and also before that as a faculty member of welcoming him to the places I served. Um, Archbishop Desmond, um, one of the great gifts he gave us was to popularize the term called Ubuntu, which is a Bantu word, um, which at its root means people. And it is um, really an, a, one word that describes um, humanism and humanitarianism in the African context. And, and, and the, it's difficult to translate into English, but the best way he would describe it is that a person is only a person through other persons. That Yvonne, um, you are a human being because I and other human beings recognize you as such and respect you and grant you the dignity of being a, another human being. And I can only understand myself as a human being because you recognize my inherent dignity as a human being. And so um, as we um, 
honor and mourn and our hearts are mixed with both sadness and gratitude, um, one way we can honor the arch, the arch as we like to be called, or Father Desmond, is by respecting the dignity and humanity of others who come here, who will come here as refugees. Thank you. Thank you so much for your reflections and guidance. And we look forward to you collaborating with us when we have the opportunity to resettle uh, refugees from Afghanistan. So thank you so much. And with this, we will conclude our webcast. Okay, um, so we're going to conclude this. If there's any final comments, I would uh, really like to thank so much um, Ambassador Kamal for your participation and insight and reflections. Um, and Mohammed has left, but I, we also reach out and say thank you so much, Mohammed. Um, Dr. Khaldun Al Musawi from Mercy Hands for Humanitarian Aid, Dr. Karen Fondacaro from Connecting Cultures and University of Vermont. Um, with Zahur Hussein for your reflections on your practical experience. And of course, Aga Jaffrey, thank you so much. Um, and we will now conclude our webcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.